where the World Health Organization is on whether or not you should transfuse blood or not. So, okay, it would be nice if I held it this way. So there's about uh, ten, 10 conditions here that they have. But the first thing is, is a transfusion of blood and products should be undertaken only to treat a condition that would lead to significant morbidity or mortality that cannot be prevented or managed effectively by other means. So they're kind of saying it's, it should be one of your last gap measures when you've tried everything else. This is sort of what they're insinuating there. And of course, if you need to increase oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, you should consider uh, administering blood. If you need to restore the blood volume because your tissue perfusion is poor, you're hypoxic. Um, if, you need, if you have coagulation issues, if you need to replace platelets or factors or other plasma proteins, you should consider administering blood. And in case of cases of trauma and bleeding, you have massive blood loss, certainly you need to uh, be uh, administering blood. If you have patients with certain thalassemias, leukemias, diseases where they just don't uh, produce their own blood, blood on their own. And then if you have excessive destruction of cells, mechanical disease, well, we have mechanical all the time with, with perfusion and ECMO and some other things. Of course, in maternity, you have catastrophic situations when the patient's bleeding or they're already anemic postpartum. And then in the age group of 5 to 29, I found this interesting because we consider this our healthiest, probably our healthiest group of age category, but they look at it as a vulnerability in, in this age range because of, first, because they're young and they may not be uh, eating, eating properly, but also because of their high activity and their, and their propensity to um, be a high metabolism, but also because of their propensity to get in accidents and, mm. and, and yeah, that's e true. easily, Drama. Uh, right, easily have motor vehicle uh, accidents or even Shootings. just, even just yeah. on the playground and have something, you know. Mm. So they the, the, found that interesting when I pulled this up. That they, that they look at that age group in particular. <clears throat> Patients with chronic blood disease, of course. Um, so perioperative transfusion, they look at eight grams per deciliter for patients undergoing cardiovascular surgery. They also include orthopedics and acute GI bleeding. So their cutoff is below eight. And this is who? Well, this is the World Health well, Organization. Well, those organizations are, uh, are their, guidelines. It's opinion. their guidelines, okay. Yeah, so, and if you have somebody with chronic anemia, it should be below seven. Somebody with an acute blood loss, if they're down to about 30% of their volume of blood loss. And that was pretty much the World Health Organization's guidelines on what they feel um, people should be considering when they, um, when they give blood. So I thought that was a good start for us to ponder some of these things. Yeah, I think all of those are, are, uh, are, are all very good points. Let me, let, me, let me share this with you and, and give you some thoughts about this, all right? So... When we think about blood, we think about obviously the oxygen carrying capacity mm -hmm. and in the critically ill patient. So, you know, you've got all these these various different subsets of patients in the population that we deal with. Right. So we've got the routine, otherwise healthy, well-nourished, isolated coronary disease or valve disease or whatever. Maybe the person has uh, been playing golf or exercising routinely through their uh, life and they have a pretty good reserve. They, you know, my view is that person can probably tolerate a relatively low hematocrit uh, or hemoglobin um, and get through the operation. Their production is higher, they're gonna, you know, they, they're gonna just tolerate it better. But somebody who is more elderly, especially little women, who are fragile, who have, um, underlying renal dysfunction, all the things, n almost no reserve. I'm concerned because I hear people talking and people who profess, I won't mention names, but who profess to be transfusion management experts. You go to all these meetings. Right. We've all been there and they stand up there all pompous that we don't transfuse until you've reached below six. Well, I mean, are, uh, are you nuts? I mean, I've seen too many times. I think that's insane. I think it is absolutely irresponsible to have these artificial thresholds. I think you have to look at any one individual patient, notwithstanding the risk and benefit 
balance that you have to have. What say you? Oh, I agree. I agree. You know, I just came from a conference and, you know, talking about restrictive transfusion and, and having that trigger. Um, you have to look, I mean, you can have that basis of say, set, let's just say seven. You can, ha you can totally have that basis, but you have to look at the individual and their disease state. I mean, if you're, if you, like, like uh, John said, like if you have a mechanical issue or you have a weird disease state, that seven might not be the magic number and you have to transfuse. So no, you have to look at every patient individually. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel. John? Yeah, I have a lot, of, lot to say about this. And um, back in the old days, Joe, back in the old days when, <laughs> when you were around and I was around, I found something interesting is that if the patient, while we we're on bypass or coming off bypass, needed blood, it was always give two units. Nobody ever said give one unit. No. It was always two units. Yeah, if you're going to give and one, was, you may as well give two. I, I, was told, I don't know right. that that's right. Now, now that's changed, but I'm, that's yeah. why I'm going back because I want to progress. Going back, nobody ever said give one unit of blood, <laughs> at least not to perfusion. It was always give two units. Right. And, and so one time I had a conversation uh, back in those days, and anesthesiologist said, uh, giving one unit's a liability. That's malpractice. If the patient needs blood, they need blood. They just don't need a little bit of blood. So I always, I kind of just stuck in my mind. Whether that was accurate or not, I don't know. But I remember him telling me that one time. And um, you flash forward to the future. Now in 2017, I mean to the present, in 2017 I was at uh, a hospital, small town hospital, and uh, this is not a knock on any, anything, but they had one, one anesthesiologist in charge of a whole team of about a dozen uh, CRNAs. And they were, they were excellent. And they all did cardiac and they did it all. But they had gotten to the point where their cutoff was, I had to come off pump with a hemoglobin of nine. And if it wasn't nine, I had to give blood. And I found myself giving blood at, you know, 8.8 .8 or even sometimes even if it was nine, we'll go ahead and give it anyway because we're gonna get diluted when I come. Because they wanted the patient to be so stable, is, is my impression, that they didn't wanna to have right. to struggle right. managing the patient mm -hmm. when, after we came off bypass, which, you know, I kind of have a little bit of issue with that because, it, you know, I actually made a note in the pump chart one day that I felt that this was inappropriate, but me giving the blood because That's it was the right it, thing it, to it do. was almost it was 8.9, yeah. and they wanted me to give two units of blood. Mm -hmm. And then there was also many times when we did give one unit of blood, and I kept remembering back to the days when I'd heard that, you know, if a patient needs blood, it needs to be a serious reason. Was there was his point when he said? don't ever give one unit of blood because I think it's a liability. His point was, patient needs blood, the patient should really need blood. Shouldn't be like, oh well, maybe, okay, go ahead and give it, you know what I mean? The patient should be suffering either hypoxic, uh, serious volume depletion, poor perfusion, um, unstable cardiac-wise, whatever the reason is, <clears throat> the patient should need blood, but not just sort of on the fence and, well, okay, go give it, you know, and give one unit, by the way. <clears throat> so um, those are the two things that came to mind and Rodell was just talking about. Um, what, what is the rule out there? Is it set, most of the time I see I mean, to be around seven. It's a fantastic question. I mean, you go to, how many hospitals do you go to? Uh, you go to about eight different uh, hospitals? Eight different hospitals. Well, seven now. Seven. seven. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to throw that in there. Uh, but uh, uh, tell me, uh, uh, what's, what's your experience? You work with a variety of different services. I, I want to say that. Um, Plus, you worked in the med center. I have. And, um, for the most part, I think most institutes, you know, usually try to dictate um, when we want to transfuse blood. And sometimes, a lot of time, it's, you know, anesthesia's preference. So, um, and, you know, obviously, at the end of the day, you know, it should be a relationship between anesthesiologist, perfusionist, and the CV surgeon, you know, managing all this. Uh, but no, I, I want to say the ballpark is probably usually between seven and eight. That, you know, seven would be probably like a borderline cutoff where, we would actually be very concerned with coming off bypass with a hemoglobin lower than seven. Um, obviously, you know, you can run into all kinds of issues coming off bypass um, and, you know, post CPB not having an you know, adequate, you know, hemoglobin. Um, you, know, you know, you have less red cells, you know, hypoxic, hypoxemia, you know, hypovolemia, um, having to deal with, you know, uh, hypertensive, you know, issues due to, you know, secondary to, you know, being anemic, you know, sometimes that can be an issue. And then, you know, obviously you don't want to treat those things with just pressures and then, you know, 
let your kidneys take a hit. You know? Right. Yeah, because yeah, anemia, hypoperfusion, or, or, or hypoperfusion from the sense of an inadequate delivery of right. O2, O2, as you had have already taught us mm -hmm. uh, in some of your earlier lectures, the kidneys are extremely sensitive to that, very vulnerable to a decrease in uh, uh, DO2. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, I mean, I think those are all good points, but what's your perspective on individualization? In other words, we have this number, mm -hmm. but why do we have these? I don't understand why we have arbitrary numbers. And if you, has it been your experience that the the number itself is the trigger or is it the number as it relates to the case I'm doing right now? Exactly. I think it's very patient specific. I think you have to look at everything. Yeah. But yeah. what is your, what is the practice out there? Um, I want to say seven, seven would be the borderline cutoff. Yeah. Um, hemoglobin that most, uh, physicians and, um, Institutes are comfortably coming off bypass with a hemoglobin up, and then obviously you know usually we can give back a couple of cell saver units and right. that'll get our hemoglobin up. So um, I think you know at the end of the day you have to be diligent of uh, trying to transfuse, but at the same time you need to treat it depending on the scenario and the patient's case, mm -hmm. and if that's going to affect the patient and um, benefit the patient in the long run. Mm -hmm. What's your experience in these hospitals? Is it an arbitrary number or is it the number as it relates to that moment? It's the latter. It's definitely the latter for me. Mm -hmm. And who's to say that? For you, but what about for, for the other people you work with? The other stakeholders, the other anesthesia, stakeholders. Yeah. the surgeons. What is, your, what is your sense of that? It's usually the latter and we always have a conversation. We always have a conversation. I have a conversation with the CRNA or the anesthesiologist and even the surgeon, you know, I, I, you know, I always address the surgeon like, Dr. So-and-so, this is my hemoglobin, this is my hematocrit, but I have this to give back, I can hemoconcentrate, I can do everything I can before we even have to transfuse. I mean, these guys are, you know, their feet are to the fire when they have to transfuse. Their yes. STS numbers are dependent upon this, you know, they're, their, their scores and, and their ICU um, stays are dependent upon transfusion. And I see it, I see it all the time. And, and actually, um, one of our hospitals, um, compared to the other hospitals in the Houston area, had the lowest um, transfusion rates. And that surgeon was very proud of that. Um, and he does some complex surgeries, I mean, that compared down to the downtown area. So that, that's saying a lot. Yes, totally. And he's, and he's pretty restrictive with, with his transfusion and he is all about the, the, the science and everything you can do without transfusing. Very restrictive. Okay, hold on one second. Do I need to tell people? <laughs> oh, okay, so everybody, if you haven't noticed, the phone line that I've been number I've been giving you is not accurate. So um, now it's the new number is up 713-505-0486. So if you've been trying to call in, but the phones haven't been working, uh, that's why. So it's up. But I think those are all very good points. But I don't know that, you know, I, I mean, I think it's important to be, pr I don't have a problem with them being proud of having the lowest transfusion numbers in the community where they work. I think that's okay. I don't necessarily think, however, that that's always the best for the patient when that's your goal. I think your goal should be to only transfuse when needed. And I'll tell you this, besides oxygen delivery, what else does hemoglobin provide? Well, it's our number one buffer. So do we want to have, you know, a problem for the patient to manage their own acid base balance because of low hemoglobin, low buff buffer? Um, and of course, it's very strong. It strongly contributes to the overall 
uh, oncotic pressure that you need within your blood in order to not third space. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, but then of course, tools like ultrafiltration, we've got, we're embattled with that. I don't know if other people have had this experience where there's actually people now trying to write papers that say that ultrafiltration during bypass causes uh, renal failure. I think that's kind of crazy. And my last point is this. Now, I understand that there's a major difference between homologous blood transfusion and autologous blood transfusion. But I think everybody knows the prevailing feeling, the prevailing sense or recommendations are that uh, pre-donation, for example, is still kind of questionable because the blood is taken out, put in a bag, put in a refrigerator, and it's left there for some period of time and then given back to the patient, right? Mm -hmm. And there's some concern that that may not really be such a good idea. But it worked really well for Lance Armstrong, <laughs> <laughs> okay? Right. So there has to be some validity because he had to have put that blood in the bag and then waited until he replenished that supply, right. which is going to take a bit of time. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. He had to recondition himself to his, you know, new hemoglobin as it continued to build back up. And then he gave himself those transfusions or the other people within that system are, uh, that did it in order to improve their endurance because they had a higher O2 delivery. Their O2 content went up because of the elevated uh, 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 hemoglobin mm -hmm. oxygen carrying capacity. So hard for me to understand, you know, again, that's not the same as allogeneic blood where you're, you have the risks of transfusion reaction, cross match, mismatch, you, or, or, or mismatch of your type and cross, um, you know, the uh, microchimerism that can occur, the increase in infection rates, and all of those things, the immunological consequences of giving a transfusion. I do understand it's a concern, but at the same time, there are so many bad things that happen to patients when they have to struggle right. to deliver enough oxygen to their tissues. Mm -hmm. John, you wanted to say something. I kind of monopolized yeah, well, that. Yeah, uh, I wanted to talk about what Adele was saying a minute ago. Um, the, 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 oh. uh, the STS, go ahead, you have a question? I have one question, I'm sorry. In my limited experience, this is from Nestor. In my limited experience, I have found with regards to transfusion, every patient is different. Surgeons will listen to the recommendations of a trusted, experienced perfusionist. Right. I think we agree with that. A good surgeon will. Okay, a good surgeon, mm -hmm. right? Because there are surgeons mm -hmm. still that exist that don't want to hear anything from anybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. They know everything. And we must be comfortable with our devices and experience when giving recommendations. That brings up iStat versus exactly. I a was coaximeter or a spun, yes. uh, spun crit. So that's right. a whole nother yeah. discussion. John, forgive me. I wanted to get that question in for Nestor. Good question, Nestor. Yeah, good point. Please forgive me. Um, so when you, the perfusionists, in my, in my opinion, find ourselves in a very unique position when it comes to this, because you were talking about the STS and the surgeons in the hospital wanting to have their numbers uh, favorable. And that is uh, admirable if you're using low amount of blood products and your, your numbers are good. It's not if you're using low amount of blood products and your numbers are bad, right? right. So they're torn between if I give the patient blood, he'll, he'll, he or she may have a much better outcome, but if I don't, then my, and he does well, then my numbers are good on it. So they're kind of on two sides of the fence on, on what, what's gonna happen with their STS numbers, right? But, but going to that same point, perfusionists, I think, are the only ones in the medical field that find themselves in this position. We're on bypass, we have a certain hemoglobin. The patient's not yet unstable because we're, we're supplying their oxygen needs. They're getting ready to go on their own. The question is, are they gonna be unstable when they go on their own. Mm -hmm. So, okay, should we give blood ahead of time? Well, maybe they're gonna be unstable, maybe they're not. So how many times have you ever heard a surgeon say, let's just go ahead and come off and wait and see if the patient's unstable? Very rarely they say that, right? Yes. They say, no, go, go ahead and give. So we find ourselves as perfusionists sitting on the threshold of taking a patient who, when we hand it off back over to their cardiovascular system, may be fine, 
and may not be fine. Right. Do we want to go ahead and say, let's go ahead and hand it off to them and let them become unstable? Now anesthesia has to try to rush and give the blood, which is going to take a lot longer than we can do because yes. we're almost we're in, we're in seconds. They're in minutes, right, giving the blood products. So that, that I've always found to be an interesting thing. But one thing that you're doing very smart, when you tell your surgeon the my hemoglobin is, let's just say, six, but I have extra volume, I can ultrafiltrate, you're giving him or her uh, tools and reasons to think that, okay, we're not stuck right here, we're going to get better, let my perfusions take me there, then we'll come off and then we'll see, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that uh, it becomes a little more complicated when you don't have the volume, you can't say right. that, but, right. but then there are surgeons that don't want to hear, hear it anyway. When they hear hemoglobin of X, it's, or anesthesia, same thing, when they hear right. hemoglobin of, and most of the time, if it's a number under seven, they don't, have, no, most people don't hesitate. Right, but that's but, the but worst that's thing not, you can do if you've got three liters in your reservoir mm -hmm. on a patient that isn't going to need it all to come off. Right. Right. You know, I mean, you know, if you come, if you come off and you have, and now you have to send it to the cell saver. Or I guess you could use the Hema bag. Yeah. yeah uh, Hema bag. Uh, 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 what's? Uh, oh, jeez. Oh, good gracious. Steve. No. What's his name? Paul. I forgot his first name. I mean, I, I'm, I must be having a stroke. I, I'm getting old. Oh, please. Keith. Keith, Keith. Smolik. Keith. What am Keith, I thinking? Yeah. Hey, Keith. I'm sorry about that, man. <laughs> but uh, you know, the Hema bag, or we can right. just make our own, which we've done before. You know, we've all done it. Um, I've come off pump before and ultra filtrated my reservoir and sure. then chased, so I'm giving high hematocrit, high mm -hmm. uh, plasma content, or, mm -hmm. you know, essentially just, you know, uh, 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 low, yeah, low plasma water. Right, I've just muffed the circuit, sure. though. Right, and, uh, and that seems to work really well. It does. Mm -hmm. I always do that. If I have enough volume and left, and then um, I can see that they are not needing any volume right now. You know, CBP, oh, PA pressure, everything looks stable. Right. Pressure looks stable. And you know, I mean, I have like three minutes, four minutes. I mean, I can easily take down 200 of that, you know, and concentrate it in, while I sit in my reservoir. While this, they're still waiting for the protamine to, to go in. While they're waiting to see a reaction to the pressure. Then once they do need some volume, I know that volume that's going in has been concentrated because I just muffed it. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, and exactly. Minutes. And it doesn't take long at all, no, Exa no. especially if you have a no. good VM concentrator mm -hmm. and you yeah. hook it up to vacuum. Mm -hmm. So we've got Jeff Campbell called in. Jeff, how you doing this morning? Good, how are you? Oh. Who is this? Yeah. Jeff, Jeff Campbell. Campbell, we can't hear him. Jeff Campbell, University of Medical Center. Here, it's kind of, it sounds kind of uh, muffled. It sounds horrible. <clears throat> hey Jeff, go ahead and talk, try talking. Yeah, um, I'm just going to try and end on the current topic. So, I mean, I agree with the panel. I think um, use of blood transfusion, yeah, I think you have to look at it as a liquid transfusion. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of articles that show the, the uh, consequences of uh, transfusion blood, the current answer, that's very funny about that. Actually, I worked with a surgeon for a long time, Dr. Thomas Rowan, very well published on the subject. And so it was the increased morbidity and mortality with um, not only low mass for some bypass, but also the use of blood transfusion on bypass. And the two combined exaggerate the um, effect. So a uh, low mass is bad, blood transfusion is bad, but when you do both, it's even worse. Um, with that said, I think, you know, you have to look at each patient's each case independently. You just can't transfuse off of a number. So if you have, sometimes I have a patient that had a group of over six, and all parameters look fine, SBOP is fine, pressure is fine, not having to give any uh, alpha agents keep pressure off. Um, Our similar is fine. Some situations like that, we'll just... We'll just keep the hemoglobin at six and not transfuse. Then we may have a patient who has a hemoglobin at eight and your three rock similar down, can't you know, maintain the blood pressure without alpha agents, something like that, we'll transfuse. So patient, you have to tailor your you know, blood transfusion pro you know, protocol to the patient and the procedure, I think. 
Yeah, well, I think I think everyone here would agree with everything that oh, you said. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Rodell knows you apparently. Yes. Yeah, is this Jeff or John? Is this Jeff or John? This is Jeff. Oh, hey, this how you Jeff. doing? Yeah. Yes, we met, and um, we've met a couple of times actually. I hope your daughters yeah, are okay. Yeah. I hope your daughters are yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, they're older now. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. How's that Achilles? I know you tore it a couple of years back. Yeah, good. Oh, I good. Just did a <laughs> Hopefully, you didn't get transfused. <laughs> no. No, but did they use platelet gel? No. Yeah, that's because I. Kind of, uh, we just... <laughs> We were out playing the job in my hospital, and it was like kind of a, uh, I tore it, and like two days later I had surgery, so I didn't right. have time to get it set up. Well, they've got a lot of platelet gel in uh, in Orlando at Disney at Pixie Dust. But getting back yeah. to uh, getting back to this this issue, John, you know, I, I, I think it was yeah. I mean Jeff, it was like Doctor Doctor Spees, who we all know from from Emory, I believe, and he uh, wrote yeah, that yeah. book on transfusions, and he had that paper that I thought was very important, which is you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Right. And, uh, yeah. you know, you, I think that the, I think for me, the takeaway message of this whole discussion is you have to do everything you can to minimize your need for transfusions, optimizing yeah. the patient's fluid status, the use of ultrafiltration, the use of albumin, which carries with it, I mean, really no risk whatsoever. Um, the use of, uh, of, of, uh, mannitol. of minimum prime circuits, yeah. mannitol you can use as yeah. well, very beneficial. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, using, keeping the volume where it needs to be. And I think as perfusionists, we've sort of forgotten that there are three very distinct uh, fluid spaces in our bodies, in our patients' bodies. You've got the intravascular, you have the interstitial, and you have the intracellular. The intracellular, of course, the highest fluid content, and the intravascular, the one that we are always thinking mm -hmm. about, has the lowest yeah. uh, uh, fluid content. <coughs> and I think that we need to be better at checking the microvascular, microcirculatory system, which I don't think we do a good job of. I don't think most of us even calculate DO2 on a routine basis when we do cases. I think we need to be more respectful of all of those things. Minimum prime circuitry, the use of tools to optimize, not dry the patient out, optimize their fluid status, and then evaluating the patient's hemodynamic stability to determine the complexity of the case, the other comorbidities, to determine whether or not this patient would actually benefit from a transfusion. And I think that if you come to the conclusion within your practice based on your experience and based on your, uh, uh, your understanding of that patient you're doing, you should give the transfusion and do so without feeling fearful that you're going to be punished by some system because you did what was right for the patient. So I think we have a multitude of mm -hmm. issues to address. And unfortunately, it's complex. We have 30 mm -hmm. minutes to do this and we have two minutes left. So let's go around the table if we can. Jeff, why don't you start it off and we'll just go around the table and get final thoughts. Yeah, well, I think the other thing with, with respect to the topic is Goal directed perfusion. So if you have, so what you you have to consider how your DO2. So if you have a lower hemoglobin, hemoglobin six or whatever, I think you need to go higher. You need to maintain some critical mm -hmm. DO2 level. So if you're at hemoglobin six, your flow requirement must be, must be maybe much greater than it would be at the hemoglobin eight. And there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, articles that look at acute kidney injury with respect to DO2 delivery on bypass. Yep. Yeah. Yep. John has so talked about way that. Starting off, pulling off the transfusion. If you're able to flow higher and maintain that critical DO2, I think that's another um, uh, another option you have as well. So, 
But yeah, been all the circuits, prescriptive oxygenation, and three inch penis oil, things like that. I mean, we've done all that. It, it does help. But I think you have to conserve the um, hemoglobin you have starting in the room. Meticulous surgery, you know, not losing a lot of blood, and just doing everything you can to, to minimize that transfusion and, and maintain good uh, oxygen delivery and life there. Very good. That's my thoughts. Jeff, those are all, I, I, awesome. I, Really, I couldn't agree with everything that you said more. And I think, I hope that the younger perfusionists who may be watching this now or will watch it in the future um, will, uh, will, will derive some really good lessons from, uh, from your experience and our experience. Rodell? Oh, I totally agree with Jeff. You know, it's, oh, hey, go Bucks, by the way. Um, so, I, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I agree with him uh, on that. Um, we have to have that critical DO2 level. I mean, that's how I've always practiced. You know, whether I knew that number or not, I keep my hemoglobin up. You know, I, it's funny, everybody watches me cut my circuit up. I don't, everybody, the, the, the thing was, the, the, the new sexy thing a couple years ago was a mini circuit. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, we have a circuit, I make a medium circuit. I still, I, I cut my venous line, I cut my arterial line, I have them cut it up at the field. So when I wrap, it's minimal detriment to the patient. So that's how I keep my hemoglobin up, on top of my oncotic drugs, on top of my hemoconcentration, on top of me talking to the anesthesiologist or CRNA, hey, can we cut the, uh, you know, that one liter of lactated ringers that, that does not have to go in. This patient's fairly stable. It's an isolated cab. You know, they're not struggling. It's not a left main. It's not aortic stenosis who's, you know, um, You have to worry about volume. any hypotension at all. Right. right. So that's not dependent on volume. So right. again, I'm trying to find that, that critical DO2 level and staying with a high hemoglobin. I agree with everything you said with the exception of rap. John? <laughs> I think uh, from a historical perspective, something that people forget about, Joe, you may remember this, but if you go back way before there was any uh, immunosuppressant drugs and they wanted to experiment and they were doing transplant, organ transplants, what they gave patients to suppress their immune system was blood. That's what, that's what they would give people to suppress their immune system. I didn't know that. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that, that was wow. when, if you go back before, uh, what is it, cyclosporin or whatever, the anti yeah. Okay, if you go back before that, which I think only was invented, came out in the late 50s or early 60s, they were doing organ transplants before that and they were being unsuccessful. They would give patients blood to suppress their immune system. We've long since forgotten that that's a negative of, of giving patients blood. And that's a problem. And, and one of the many, but, but I think you know, what Rodell says is, is great, and I think of all of us were basically looking at preventing getting to that low hemoglobin in the first place, doing whatever you can do, planning out ahead of time. And I remember one time I had a, uh, he listened to a lecture and at a meeting and someone was talking about this very same thing, and someone stood up and asked a question and said, yeah, you know, we do all this in the OR, but as soon as they get to the unit, they just give them blood. And they just, you know, they, they don't have these tight constraints of going all the way to the edge before, before they get blood. So this, this what you're talking about, um, as perfusionists, we can do a, a little about it, but not a lot, but to try to carry that mentality over, at least into the post-operative phase, because sometimes it, it is negated. All of our efforts come sometimes are negated in the ICU. Yeah, no kidding, that's yep. very true. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they all made good points, you know, just keeping, you know, uh, being aware and keeping thoughts on all the variables that factor into uh, what's going to help the patient, because at the end of the day, that's what your goal is. Um, and all the tools that we have set for us, you know, hemoconcentrating, muffin, um, you know, minimizing our circuit, you know, uh, reducing the hemodilution, even maybe maybe having the, the, uh, the surgeon in the scrub at the field cut the, the strip, cut, cut some of the circuit off because usually they have, they have a lot of an extension, you know, a circuit. Well, I call that the, I call that the surgeon's loop. Exactly. When the venous oh. line comes up and has a big giant exactly. loop to he, he doesn't have that with me. That's just None crazy. of my surgeons have that with that me for? anymore. You know, I understand sometimes you got to move it over, mm. but you don't need you don't a big need giant loop exactly. in order to do exactly. that. It's kind of silly. Right. No. And I hate going to places, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but those are all very good thoughts. Uh, and I agree with everything on that. Um, but have you ever been places where 
they have their way of doing it. They've been doing it like this forever. It's really not a good way to do it. Right. And mm -hmm. the you'll mention something like, hey, can you cut that line right there? And they're like, this is how we do it. Mm -hmm. You know, and you get the scrub who has no, and I love scrubs. I love everybody that, you know, yeah. I love people. I mean, I do. But sometimes I think they get caught in this paradigm of, Routine. you know, why are you mm -hmm. even saying this to mm -hmm. us? But they're mm -hmm. not thinking what the consequence right. of it is. Yeah, and that's something that bothers me. So what's interesting about that, I did get a lot of pushback because I will cut at least 18 inches off of both sides up at the table pack. And our lines are too long. We need to fix yeah. that. Well, you know, yeah, I tried to fix that. It's it's in the process. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, you know, I did get that pushback. And they're like, well, we've never done this. How come you're the only one that does this? No one else does this in your group. I said, well, guess what? This one's for this is for the patient. Mm -hmm. And that ends the conversation right then and there. I'll say, like, the surgeon, I go with this surgeon at all these places. He doesn't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem with it. Please do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, not as stern, but if you have that conversation as a professional to professional, it gets done. Absolutely. And I think sometimes we also need to be thinking, we need to ask the surgeon sometimes, please make sure, move the, manipulate the cannula. We've got yes. crummy drainage and yes. we're pouring fluid in the patient. We know this is not going to end well. It's not helpful to the patient. Mm -hmm. Some people, you know, I mean, I've made this comment. It's kind of a joke. You know, it's, it's, it's both easy and hard to kill people. Thank goodness, because we do heart surgery on people, and what you think what we do to them, and they come out and survive it, it's really hard to kill people. But yet, it's sometimes some people, it's the simplest little thing, right. mm -hmm. and it tipped them over the edge. And you never know where that's going to happen or when it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But on the immunosuppression thing, maybe if we were a little more cautious, mm -hmm. gave blood as needed, mm -hmm. and we reduced the strain on our blood supply. The cross matching, the freshness of the blood, the the antibody searches, the the nucleic amplitude testing, the NAT testing that they do on it, all of those things may actually reduce the immunosuppression effect of making the blood supply safer by reducing the strain on blood banks to keep up with the amount of blood that we that we use. Because cardiac surgery is what twenty five percent of the uh, nation's blood supply is consumed right. just within mm. cardiac surgery. Mm -hmm. Quite a bit. Yeah. Apparently my mic went down. The batteries are there. I told you we should have changed the batteries. <laughs> okay. I think we have s successfully completed this topic. Yes. Mm -hmm. Jeff, thank you thank so you, Jeff. much for calling in. Thank, and thank you, Jeff. Being... Just logged on. So he's logged. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Call back on another one if you'd like, because we're gonna we're gonna tackle right. Del Nido cardioplegia next. Yeah, guys. Yeah, bye. Sounds good. Thanks, Jeff. That was a that was a